right, so next up we have Rob Engel. He is actually a CMU alumnus. He graduated from the Silicon Valley campus with a master's in software engineering. He's been with MLD Advanced Media for seven years. He's played a pivotal role in developing StatCast. And we're grateful to have Rob here because as statisticians, we don't get this fun data unless people like Rob are actually developing the technology to do it. Uh, hi all, uh, my name is Rob, thank you for the introduction Ron. Um, so I'll just start off, uh, what is StatCast? I'm sure most of you in this room know what StatCast is, but uh, it really depends who you ask in the baseball industry what StatCast is, it might have a different meaning. Um, for me, uh, I run the engineering team at MLB. StatCast to us is basically just the, the technology that tracks all the players on the field at all times, it tracks the ball, and aggregates that data, aligns it with event-based play-by-play data, and we come up with different models and stats. Um, but we also feed this to all of our products now, and our product suite has only gotten larger uh, since we started the StatCast. Uh, our product suite has game day on that bat, as everybody here I'm sure has seen. But now we have a lot more to do with the broadcasts. So every time you see a pitch speed on TV or even within the ballpark, that is now part of the stack hat suite. That comes through our entire infrastructure in real time. Uh, you'll probably see pitchcast now, which is a subset of stack cast. It's 3D replays on trails on television. Uh, you're seeing a ton in the World Series. Um, you also see K-Zone um, uses stack cast now as well to plot the, the location of the ball in real time on the home plate. Uh, likewise, you see the broadcast component of the stat cast for home run distance replays, uh, showing sprint speeds, cash flow abilities, route efficiencies. Um, I can go on with all the different stat names. Um, so it really depends who you're asking uh, what a stat cast is. And it might take on a different meaning. Uh, in the analytic community, uh, it probably you know has to do more with like the cash flow ability and the stuff Tom Tango has been working on. But in the broadcast community, it has more to do with cool visuals that we can do in 3D space uh, and automation of some of the graphics just using data. Um, so today, I'm just going to get into a little bit of the technical side of StatCast um, that doesn't get as much press. Uh, so how does it work? Um, we have six cameras in the stadium, in every stadium. All are HD. They're all along the third baseline. We have two consoles. Um, each hold three cameras in. And all six cameras are pointed at different parts of the field. Uh, we merge together all the different cameras and get one large image of the field. And we use pixel, pixel detection to determine who's who on the field. Likewise, we have one Doppler radar panel that tracks the ball. So it tracks the pitch, the hit. This samples at a much higher rate than the cameras. So we're able to get a lot more cool things like spin rate, uh, spin axis, speed. Whereas the, the camera data is 30 frames per second. So any of that data would have to be inferred from the cameras. So the radar gives us a lot more high quality data. Uh, oh, and lastly, we have a metrics engine. So basically, we take that raw data that we read from the ballpark and funnel it into this metrics engine and spit out more metrics and measurements, such as uh, sprint speed, or home to first time. Um, not just raw XY values, but something that happened on the play. Uh, arm strength for outfielders, um, you know, solo base time, all that stuff. Uh, and I'll get into some of the more context behind that, too. So here's some images. Uh, the radar panel I didn't mention is right behind home plate in all the stadiums. It's a little bit offset at different ones, depending on you know visibility of the fans. And then this is the camera panel. We have two of these in every stadium. Uh, one's usually right along third base, and one's a little bit further down the third base line. Uh, and then how does the output work? So basically, we capture all this data in real time. It, at peak, we'll have 15 concurrent games going, recording data at 30 frames per second. So we need a way to aggregate all this data in real time and distribute it out to the world. So out to the world means we need to distribute it within the ballpark to the scoreboards, to the actual broadcast trucks. But also, we need to distribute it to all of our different web devices, whether it's at bat, whether it's game day, whether anything. Uh, any people scrape the site. Uh, that all comes out of our new API, and this has to scale to many millions. Um, just last night, uh, I think we had 
about a billion total requests against our API during the World Series, um, just with the game day feeds. So we have to make sure that you know this scales well. Uh, likewise, we have to make sure that the actual technology that feeds the scoreboards and the broadcast is completely separated from the technology that feeds the website. Uh, like I said, a billion requests hitting the website, we don't want that to affect the broadcast. So if they bring down our website, we still want the broadcast to work and all the instantaneous scoreboard displays. So we have to separate our concerns. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware that StackCast is powered by Amazon Web Services. <laughs> what this truly means is we use a lot of EC2 instances, which are just scalable servers. So basically, like last night, there's a lot of traffic. We're able to add you know, 100 more servers to scale up for that night and we can bring it back down after the game, and we're going to receive less traffic. So this is a way to save money, and also just to make sure that the website doesn't go down. Uh, likewise, we're able to do a lot of cool things with Amazon Web Services for StackCast. Uh, so we're receiving all this data in real time. We can easily aggregate it and store it in various services they have. Uh, it's easy to spin up databases, and even more cool, as I mentioned, like EC2, you can just scale up a bunch of different instances and run parallel processing. So someone was talking about, you know, or 21 days to, to process um, some of the basketball data. Um, you know, with baseball, we've been able to expedite that um, to do all three seasons with the stack hats by just scaling up a bunch of instances and running stuff in parallel. Uh, so that's kind of a bit of how the back end works. Um, we have a, a data warehouse that we we're building. I'll get into it a little bit later. But uh, Amazon has very many nice out of the box things, especially Redshift, which is uh, Postgres style database, Columnar that you just spin one up in Amazon, you can import a bunch of data really easily, and it's really easy to work with. Um, yeah, so here's just an example of some of the outputs uh, in a more visual reference. So basically, for every single play, we're able to determine, based on the cameras, the radar, uh, what the actual stringer, who's the scorekeeper of the ballpark is entering, and then give something relevant. So here's a double play from Game 2 of the World Series this year. Uh, from the data itself, we can identify exactly what is relevant to that play. Um, so since it was a 6-4-3 double play, here's the fielders who were involved, and here's the stats that are even relevant. So one of the main things in StackCast is we're tracking all nine players at all times, all the runners, the umpires, the coaches, the batter. But in most plays, nobody's doing anything. I have a fly ball to left field, for example. You really don't care what the right fielder did. Um, you guys are talking about in football how that's a lot more important what some of the other players are doing. But you know the result for a fly ball to left field doesn't have anything to do with the right fielder. So we want to filter out some stuff like that just to avoid noise. We do capture the starting position and all the positions for all the players at all times. So if you're trying to do work with shifts, we obviously have that. But the nice thing for the broadcast is we're actually able to just say, hey. Here's where you should focus the cameras, and here's what the stats are relevant for this play. So when you're doing a replay, it's really easy. So you can just pan using the players here and the stats to show what's relevant. Uh, likewise, we have these little diagrams that we're putting in game day over the last few years that actually depict the entire play. So traditionally, our play-by-play -play would just read, you know, Brian McCann grounds out to Justin Turner, double play to Corey Seager to Cody Bellinger. But now you can actually see what happened on the play from the bird's eye angle. So this is something we never really had in the past, that adds that extra level of detail. So you know where the players were, where they were positioned, where the ball was actually hit. Um, and we also, I think on the website we throw up some exit velocity numbers too, so you can see actually how hard it was hit. Um, and all this stuff greatly improves the fan experience. So like I said, uh, we power all the in-stadium displays now for pitch speed, and a lot of the, uh, the teams are now adopting the exit speed and home run distance. Um, so I was just at Dodger Stadium, and they were instantly would show home run distance for all the home runs. And they're also showing exit speed. And I was talking to Max yesterday. He said that the Yankee Stadium is showing it now. I think I've seen it at Safety Field. So a lot of different teams are starting to adopt uh, a lot of more in-stadium stack hats things. We give to them in real time basically any of the data so they can choose whatever they want that they think is good for the in-stadium display. Um, so right now, a lot of the teams are just looking at you know, how can we augment the, the experience with the fan using this data. Um, obviously, one of the most important things to our industry is to bring fans into the seats. So anything we can do with the technology to, to help that um, is great. Uh, likewise, our MLB.com apps, you've all seen game day. Um, you've seen how we've integrated some of those field metrics into game day. 
Um, Darren's website, Savant, has a lot of this stuff as well. Um, a lot of cool visualizations are out there. Um, uh, content, too. We have, you've all seen the video highlights on OMB.com with all the various stats we have. Um, and then a lot of the articles that Petrello writes and integrates all this data uh, and really calls out some of the, the better things about StatCast and really analyzes the players. Uh, and then augmented and virtual reality is a brand new territory we're exploring with this data. Uh, at the Apple press conference last month, we actually demoed a, an iPad augmented reality app that uses the data stream in real time in the venue. So you basically hold the iPad up and it'll, you'll see the players moving around. You know, it was pretty, pretty fun. Um, and you could quick player and pull in all the stats and hone in on them. It's just a, it's like an experiment with what the data can really do. Uh, we're also looking at virtual reality stuff where basically you can immerse yourself into a game in 3D space and just kind of see everything transpiring in real time as if you were on the field at any position. Um, and, you know, the possibilities are limitless with what we could do on these fronts. So here's a, an image of the augmented reality. So this is at AT&T Park. In real time, it has little dots above the players. And you know, it'll show the pitch trail as it's thrown. And this is a pretty cool example of what can be done with the technology. Likewise, uh, we have these 3D graphics that we have internally for every single play that just tell you the exact full context of the play. I showed you guys the summary earlier. But is it kind of, it's, that's just a summary of the full 3D. Well, it's 2D here. But entire play. So all this stuff really helps with the fan experience because you can really see what's going on that just helps augment what the traditional play-by-play -play text screen can tell you. Uh, obviously for this crowd, uh, the evaluation is very important too. Um, so, you know, teams and coaches, uh, analytics departments, the community, all evaluate players using this data now. Obviously, we only let a subset out to the community, but the teams get all the data, everything, the XYZ values, so they can run all their models and do everything they need to do. Um, so per play, we can actually now see all the observed things. How hard was the ball hit? How fast did somebody run? Um, and it's really important, actually, for our business to add context to all this. So when it goes on TV for the first time and we introduce a new metric, such as cap probability or sprint speed, Nobody really knows what that means the first time they see it on TV. Whereas fastball velocity, people have seen that forever and know exactly what a good fastball is. So it's important that we put contact with all these metrics. So what we're trying to do on TV is anytime a new metric is introduced, or mostly anytime we use any of the metrics on TV, we'll say, you know, this player ran at 28 feet per second on this play, but here's what his average is, here's his best, here's the league's average, here's the league's best. That way we can at least tell the user what's, or the viewer what's good, what's bad. Otherwise, without context, it's just not very useful, uh, at least for the fan experience. Um, and then uh, we also have con contextual metrics as well. So everything I described up there is on a the per play basis. More context, such as catch probability, has to study the entire data set to see, you know, <coughs> based on how far I needed to run and how much time I had to get there, how often does that ball get caught. So this actually has to query our database in real time to come up with that, to study the entire historical data set. And that actually really helps move the product forward. Because the more context we can add, the more relevance we can add to all these stats, the more useful it is for fans and for players. Um, we're also introduced something new at the end of the season, the sack fly probability. Uh, basically, it can be used for broadcasters during the downtime. So if someone reaches third with less than two outs, as we all know, baseball lends itself to a lot of talking between pitches. So the broadcaster can now say, hey, Here's the probability of a sack fly happening here based on the runner and the outfielders and their arm strength and the runner's speed. Um, and we're working on stolen base probability as well. So based on the battery and the, and the, the runner's speed, what are the chances that he'll succeed on a stolen base right here? But also, what are the chances even to try to try to steal a base here? Uh, so you'll start to see more and more of these kind of probabilities come out on the broadcast in years to come. This is broadcasters get a little more familiar with it, and as the data becomes a little more stable. Uh, so as I mentioned, with context, um, it's super important that we have ways internally to, to, to know this. So we have a tool that broadcasters can use, and internally we can use. Anytime something happens, you can click on a stat and determine, oh, is that good or bad? 
So I think uh, Aaron Hicks threw a ball last year, two years ago, at around 105 miles an hour. And I think it got out on Twitter, and people were saying, oh my god, like, is that legit or not? And it turns out it's legit. So most people don't think about outfielders taking a full pro hop and throwing as hard as they can. It makes sense that they have a comparable arm to a pitcher that they could throw harder than that. Um, so we're able to see in real time now that, you know, that Brett Phillips throw he made this year, one of a few, was the hardest all year. So we're able to easily you know, determine in real time, is this a good play, is this a bad play? Um, yeah, and this stuff is imperative for broadcast. Uh, touch on most of this. We've also integrated uh, Statcast into you know, the Home Run Derby. So it's actually affected the rules of the Home Run Derby now. So if a player hits a home run and two home runs over 440 feet, they get 30 seconds additional bonus time. Uh, and then the broadcast really uses it heavily as well. So you know, Statcast is really getting into all aspects of the game. So here's the SAC fly probability I was describing earlier. So basically the idea here is uh, based on all these outfielders' arm strengths and then the runner on third speed, how far does the batter need to hit the ball to get the, batter, uh, the runner to score? So in front of the red, he's going to be out. In the yellow, it's kind of a toss-up, so it's up to chance, really. And then beyond the green, it's almost a sure thing that the runner's going to score. Uh, and then internally, we're actually able to clip videos on a per pitch basis in real time using the stat cast data. So we're able to identify very easily what, what are the top plays of the day. So for example here, the Brett Phillips throw just shows up on this internal tool. So we know right away that this is the hardest throw thrown all year. So we can get it out there on the website. Likewise, we have, cash, we have all the stats internally. Um, and then using StatCast to clip videos has also made things much, much, much easier. Um, and likewise, trying to help our partners try to identify the best plays of the day and develop highlight reels, something like cash probability is really it's similar to trying to bucket the different basketball plays that are similar. Cash probability tries to identify similar plays that are awesome or not good, um, imperatively with the data, um, less more so than on the aesthetic effect. Uh, so Q&A, uh, my first answer is yes, I work with Tom Tango. My second answer is no, you're not going to get his real name. <laughs> yeah, the difference. over on the floor. Is there any data you, you wish you still could collect that you uh, we reached the pinnacle of what you what you want to collect? No, we we're always exploring more. So we're looking into limb tracking, um, seeing if we could identify. So right now we report center of mass of all the players, but if we could identify such as somebody's toe as they're trying to step on first base, we could even enhance the experience for even the re instant replay, trying to say, oh, well we know exactly where his toe was at the point that the ball hit the, uh, the first baseman's. So we're trying to get as granular as we possibly can. So it's a constant evolution. What extent are teams using this information for scouting purposes, or is it just for entertainment for fans? Uh, we give the data to all the teams, all the data, um, and that's kind of the end of my scope of that. So you have to ask the teams themselves on what exactly they're doing with it. Um, so I think Paul may be able to speak to that more. Uh, uh, Robert, are the um, the advances you're making in data, are they geared towards the in-stadium experience or more for um, the at-home experience? In, in, uh, in, in like virtual everything. reality, is, I mean... We're, we're trying to find every use case possible with this data and how could this bring more fans in or keep fans. So if, 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 if anything we can do to increase the number of fans, the better. And in 2017, people consumed data so much differently than they ever had, and just watched the game differently. So if we could just help keep a couple of fans by doing something small on the iPhone app, that's a huge success. Or doing something in the stadium display to keep fans going to the game, it's also a huge success. So we're constantly studying how to just engage fans using this data, just to keep them entertained. Okay, so do you think there's, in some kind of metrics, is there a trade-off between, like, the, the, the number of frames per second and the, the actual metric? So, like, maybe if you want to approximate the velocity, you might need 10 frames per second rather than 30. And is there some kind of trade-off between 
how high a resolution you have and, and, the, and the quality of the estimate of the metric you want to provide? Sure, sure. So, I mean, mostly like fastball speeds and spins are, are done better with the radar because it samples at a lot higher. Right. With lower fidelity cameras on an outfielder, you know, 700 feet away from the camera, it's much harder to get an optically tracked throw and get that high fidelity of the spin rate and the speed. Um, and at 30 frames per second, that far away, we can't quite get the perfect speed like the radar can give us. Um, but as we increase the frame rate and get higher definition cameras, we can start to get more of that data. Yeah. So when you first developed, or when you came first about this, what were some of the issues that you guys ran into just working with such a long time? Uh, uh, so, so one parable I like to tell is we've designed all these metrics around no data at all. So we said, here's the 70 metrics we want to have for StatCast before we saw what the data looked like. So after about three months into 2015, we had to kind of step back and say, okay, well, you know, pop time isn't perfect, just, you know, capture the second. There's going to be things in the data we didn't think about or account for before we saw the data. So we had to put about five different things in place to account for a catcher scooping the ball out of the dirt, throwing it to second. Um, it would add an extra hop in the ball in distance, or a catcher air mailing the second baseman, or a catcher short hop in the second baseman. We had some weird data because we weren't necessarily standardizing what is a pop time. So actually what we did is we just normalized that metric. So basically pop time in our system is basically as soon as it touches the catcher's mitt for the first time to when it did or would have crossed second base. So this also kind of normalizes what the second baseman is going to step forward a little bit. We would, we would actually project where the ball, when the ball would have gone to second. That way if he airmails it, we count it still um, so we could see kind of what but then we also use the actual play-by-play -play data to determine you know, if that was a successful throw or not. Um, but yeah, mostly like, not knowing what the data looked like was the biggest issue. And then this year, probably the next biggest issue is feeding all this broadcast information and learning valuable lessons like separating out the technology concerns. Of, you know, the game day experience that's viewed by millions needs to be completely separated for something that's feeding in stadium displays. Because if one goes down, you can't let it take down the whole system. So just trying to figure out architecturally how to break everything down into small pieces and uh, keep the most uptime as possible. All right. Thank you.